Hi, and welcome to Conversations. And we're here with the famous Lonnie McFadden. Thank you for being on the in the set with us today. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I saw your performance, and we're going to get into that much, much, much more. But um, how, what area did you grow up in, Kansas City? I grew up in the inner city, right here in Kansas City. I went to Lincoln High School and uh, Linwood Elementary School, and and basically was just one of the guys in the hood, I guess, okay. so to speak. <laughs> okay, so any other siblings? Besides yes. you and your brother, I know. Okay, my brother and I, who still perform together. And then my sister, the only sister I've got is the ex-politician, but always has been a minister, Reverend Sandra McFadden Weaver. Okay. That's, that's our only sister. And then I had a younger brother, but he passed early on. And uh, So there were originally four of us, but Ronald and I are the only ones that, that uh, followed in our father's footsteps, so to speak. Okay. You know. Okay. Okay. Uh, Later on, you guys paralleled your father's career, yeah. and we're going to get into that. So uh, tell us a little bit about your dad. God, well, I don't know where to start. I, I try to keep it brief. Basically, I've never met a more fun-loving, enjoyable person. He never met a stranger. I mean, if he was, like you asked earlier, if he was still around, I said the reason you can tell he's not around is he's not at my gigs. I mean, he he was at all, all our performances. He was... Uh, He's the reason I tap dance. I mean, I know that's probably answering one of your other questions that we would have got to, but he is he's the reason. He's he's the reason I like jazz. He's the reason I like all of this the, the stuff that I do because he made it so much fun. I mean, my father would would tell the stories about being on the road when he was like 12 and 13 years old and 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 uh times getting hard and getting stranded in Philly or Detroit or someplace and having to live off of peanuts and Pepsi Cola. Mind you, you're talking to a kid and you're telling a kid this and I'm like, where can I sign up? I mean, you know, this was like like great stories to me, so I always wanted to do it and and he started showing my brother and I tap dance steps when we were real little and we didn't I mean we had no idea that How old were you? I'd say three and four years old, you know, he just said, Hey man just try this. And by the time we get it, my father was so over the top enthusiastic about it. I mean, we always wanted to learn something new. So by the time we were like five and six years old, he finally brought us these tap shoes, you know, this, the bright, shiny patent leather shoes with the little noisemakers on the bottom. So we, you know, so, and we knew how to do a little bit. So it was, it was, it was kind of cool until it was time. Now it was time to practice though, because at this point he starts putting routines together. I hated it. God, I hate it. I used to cry. You know, everybody else is outside playing football. I'm in the house. And, you know, okay. so that was it. But but the first gig that I ever did, I was seven years old. And, as, and uh, my brother and I both were paid. We we worked at the uh, old Mulebach Hotel downtown Kansas City. That was one of our first gigs. And it was another... It was another rooftop restaurant called Top of the Towers. I can't remember exactly what building that was in, but I remember those two places. I remember us getting gigs with my father. He had quit dancing, but he just took gigs so we could. I mean, he, he was a hands-on father. He was the father I aspired to be. If any of my kids remember me even a fraction as reverently as I remember my father, I did a good job because he was, he was a hands-on father. He was there. He was there for us. Very good. Yeah. Now, he also performed with some of the greats. Oh, yeah. I mean, my dad. My dad performed with Count Basie when he was like 12, 13, 14 years old, you know. And uh, Jay McShann. I met Jay McShann in my dining room. One we used to, when I had this band, which I'm jumping in. But when I had a band, we used to practice in my mom and, mom and dad's basement. And I remember coming upstairs to get some water or go to the restroom. And, and my dad said, hey, come here. I want you to meet somebody. And it's Jay McShann, you know, just sitting up there kicking it with my dad. And so, I mean, I met a lot of really great jazz musicians because of my father. And uh, later on, we we kind of did recreate what it was like when they first opened the 18th and Vine Street area. They had a big performance with the Count Basie Orchestra. And my brother and I performed with the Count Basie Orchestra, which started a, a relationship where they, we went to Europe and all kind of things, you know, under their, their uh Umbrella. We were we were managed by Count Basie Enterprises for a while, but uh, but yeah, they threw out a piece of plywood in the middle of 18th Street, and we tap danced in front of the Count Basie Orchestra when when the 18th and Vine Street area first opened up. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, 
you talk about your different performances, but did that include a recital that uh, you guys did? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was that was interesting. I mean, my mom and dad. I don't talk about it, my mom as much, but God, she was always there. But it's like they they had put so much into us. We started taking piano lessons at five and six years old. We went to the Conservatory of Music out at UMKC. Then we took private lessons, and that's when we we had our first recital. It was it was our recital. It wasn't like you you see Miller Morley or some some dance studio, or some music studio. This was me and Ronald. We played piano. We played organ. We sing, well, it was loosely described as singing, Hey, look me old Berlin. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, was, it was bad. It was, it was bad. It was corny. It was vaudeville. It was my dad. It was what he was about. And he, he showed us all these old vaudeville things. And I just remember us doing, Hey, look me over, lend me in there, fresh out of clover, mortgage up to here, and don't. Pay. I mean, it was, it was so corny. But, but we sang, we tap danced, we played the organ and piano. And, and have fun. We had a ball. Yeah. <laughs> we had a ball. Okay, you talk about uh, the tap. Now, yeah. as you entered uh, junior high school. Yes, like I said, I grew a up in A change years. came about. <laughs> Quite a bit of change. Okay. You know, you start liking girls. You start realizing that that uh, girls are attracted to popular things, not tap dancers. Okay. <laughs> you know, at least, right. like I said, I grew up in the inner city. And so... That wasn't one of the things that would have made me cool or popular. So I always loved music, though. We, Like I said, we started taking piano lessons and we were tap dancing. But during the time we came up, you know, we grew up in the late 60s and early 70s, basically. So we're talking about James Brown cooling the gang. The Beatles was, that was my first, the first, first group that really caught my attention was the Beatles. Okay. But as we grew older... And, you know, like I said, your, your pre-teen years, 12, 13, 14, you know, when you really just, girls are starting to change a little bit and your ideas are changing and and I wanted to be, do something popular. So I, I focused on the trumpet, Ronald focused on the saxophone. And uh, I, I think the reason that we uh, gravitated toward those instruments, two things. We had a guy that was a mentor that later on was part of my, my growth, too. A guy named Clyde Bagby. We used to call him Binky. He had a band later on. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but later on he had That's a band okay. called Clyde and him and I. We were friends. And and he was older than us, but he would sit in the floor and play racing cars with us and stuff. And he was so cool. I mean, you you know, you figure you're 12 years old, 11 years old, 10 years old, and you got this guy that's 16, 17 years old. He wears these nice clothes. You know, when you're a right. kid, you see a teenager, you think they are, they, they old enough to have some kind of clout about them, but they're not like grown people. Grown people are so old fashioned, but teenagers are like, wow. And we wanted to be like Clyde. You know, he had this, this old Lincoln Continental with the kissing doors, and, you know, I, I wanted to be, so both of us wanted to play trumpet. Ronald, Eventually, my dad said, well, one of you got places. So Ronald just kind of let me have my way, which was the best right. thing in the long run because the saxophone definitely fits Ronald's personality better. And I, I'm, I'm a trumpet player. Okay, you know, we're going to talk more about that when we come back from a break, okay? Okay. And we're here with Lonnie McFadden, and we'll be right back after this break. <laughs> Another adventure with Savings Man. Oh dear, I can't afford that. Charge it. You can pay it off later. Not so fast, credit card guy. Savings Man. Don't let him entice you, ma'am. Credit card guy can lead you to big trouble. You need a savings plan. You're right, Savings Man. Get this ballpark estimate worksheet at choosetosave.org. It will help you get started. Gee, thanks, Savings Man. No, thank you. So visit choosetosave.org and get your ballpark estimate today. Hi, and welcome back to Conversations. We're here with Lonnie McFadden, and we're going to continue this. Uh, so, you started your own group. Yes. What age was that? I was 17 years old when I started, started my own group. I had played on the road with this other band that, like I mentioned, this guy Clyde Bagby was was a mentor and and so he had this band called Clyde and him and her they were they used to play on the jazz floor they were like 
17, 18 years old, and they were getting a lot of critical acclaim back when Kansas City had real jams. I mean, real jazz festivals. People like Maynard Ferguson, Count Basie, Dizzy Gillespie. Everybody used to come here back then at the Municipal Auditorium, and Clattenham and Her was one of the local bands that were always featured, and they were so good as teenagers. Anyway, I, they needed a trumpet player. I had been following them around from the time I was like 12 and 13, 14 years old. And I, when I turned 16, they needed a trumpet player, and uh, they had heard about me. It, Clyde didn't realize I was the little dude he used to play in the floor with, and when he, he came to meet me, he's like, whoa. Because, like I said, I, I started building up a little rep as a teenager. And, uh, and so he asked me to play with his band. I played with his band for about a year and three months. Long and short of is it of it is Ronald wasn't in the band. Since Ronald wasn't in the band, I I eventually got to the point I I wanted to to I thought things would be stronger with me and Ronald because I was hearing my own ideas, and um and so we were we were used to travel a lot with Clyde and her. We left Kansas City and went out to the West Coast, California and Vegas mainly. We went uh, San Diego, San Francisco. Uh, uh, Phoenix, LA, and Vegas, and that's where we were at when I left the band. I started my own band, and eventually it became they. We all named it. Everybody teases me, but we all named it Lonnie and the Band. Okay. And uh, uh, of course, I, I was the leader, but I, I'll be the first to admit I wasn't the most talented. I I think that the most naturally talented people in that band was the bass player Tyrone Clark, who is still a phenomenal bass player, and my brother Ronald. He was, Ronald was always. Now, who so did the writing? I did the writing. I, I did some songs. Tyrone collaborated with me, but I did like 90% of the writing. I did all the arranging for the band. I arranged all the songs. And then later on, when we, because we used to go to Japan a lot, and that was interesting. That's what got us back into dancing because during that time, uh, the people when you go to Japan everybody sing the songs with you but what made you great in America is if you had your own identity your own way of doing things over there since we didn't do it just like the record we weren't going over that good so we started being more visual and that's when Ronald and I got back into tap dance um, 17 going to Japan well or? the first time okay well, I started the band at 17 the first time we went to Japan I was actually 20 years old okay yeah and so everybody in the band, all of us were like 19 and 20 years old. And the first time we went to Japan, we were in uh, Kyoto, a small city, but it's all old Japan. And, and we were staying in Uji City. That was, a, that was quite a culture shock for me. It's all the, everybody's walking around in kimonos and in those wooden shoes that it's like a block of wood and two pieces. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'd never seen anything like that. And there's no locks on the doors. You just got these sliding doors. And, and I'm like I said, I'm from the inner city where everybody's locking up everything. Right. So it was it was quite a culture shock, but we found that to be home for the next five years. We'd go over to Japan for four months at a time. And after the first year, it was always Osaka, Japan, which was more like I guess that'd be the Japanese equivalent to Chicago. Okay. It was commerce, commerce, business, business. It was real fast pace. And we loved it. Okay. You know, and that's that was it. But then the band Ran its course. I mean, we were together about 10 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then, you know, people start getting married and, and growing up and having children. And everybody, you know, by now we started as teenagers. Now everybody's a grown man in their own, and, and very, very proficient as musicians in their own right. So everybody's individuality started showing. The band broke up. We're still all good friends, but everybody went in their own respective ways. And, and then that left me without a job. So what does Lonnie do of uh, Lonnie, Lonnie and the Band? Lonnie starts his, well, that's when the famous McFadden Brothers were born. That is when we became the McFadden Brothers. But I got to be honest, it was Ronald that, that had the foresight because when we had Lonnie and the Band, I was just in the band. I was just arranging and everything was about the band, 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 band. Ronald was, you know, after you get so you can do that, it's like you need a hobby or something. And Ronald has always been able to think of doing lots of things. So he started putting his tap dancing together very good. I just learned routines. Ronald started collecting old videos of, of Honey Coast, Baby Lawrence, uh, uh, Sandman Sims, 
old stuff of Sammy Davis that was obscure. He started collecting all this stuff and really learning. <clears throat> Ronald really became a good tap dancer. I was just just able to do the gig. When Lonnie and the band broke up, Ronald said, why don't we go back to basics and do what we did as kids and just be entertainers. We're, we'll hire a band when we get a job and and uh, it'll just be him and I and that's that's what we now started doing. And you guys also perform with some of the greats as, uh, as well as your dad. Name a few of the of the great musicians you've, you've worked with. Well, I, I, I start with that first time out as the McFadden Brothers. We were hired to, to be a featured act on Olita Adams' show. She did a, a show here in Kansas City, and she's a very good friend of ours. And uh, that was that was pretty much where our career started as the McFadden Brothers. Later on, maybe a couple of years later in St. Louis, we performed with Sammy Davis Jr. A couple of years after that, Tony Orlando. Uh, and then later on, I think the longest relationship we had with anybody. Of course, we performed with Count Basie Orchestra, like I said. Right. We traveled with them, and we, we were doing jam sessions with the Marcellus Brothers and George Benson and stuff, all of that over in Europe. I mean, we, we were doing all of that. But then we, we spent three years with Wayne Newton, too. That was that was probably the longest, and that's what took us over to Iraq and all that stuff okay. that we did. And, uh, but, yeah, I mean, this is... It's been a cool journey, and it's it, still going on. It sounds like it has oh, been. Oh, man. I'm having a ball. <laughs> so uh, tell me about Sammy Davis, Jr. Sammy Davis. He was a friend of my father's. They met on the, back then, the Chitlin Circuit, uh, RKO Circuit, whatever you want to call it. They were, this is like Vaudeville, you know. This is like when Sammy Davis was with a group called the Will Masson Trio, and my father was with a tap dance group called the Chocolate Drops, and they played all in the same circuit. Now, obviously, Sammy got out of it because Frank Sinatra saw him a band. Well, my dad and his group were still in that group, but in in that circuit, but they all knew each other. And so later on, when I met Sammy Davis in, in uh, St. Louis, my introduction was that this is Jimmy McFadden's kids, and my father had just passed in 85. And Sammy put us on his show in, in St. Louis. And he introduced us and told the people about my dad. I think it's a well, I don't think it's a clip of of him doing that on YouTube right now, okay. talking and that's that's uh the first time we actually met him when my and like I said, my dad my dad knew him. Okay. Know. Sounds wonderful. Yeah, it was, it was great. That's interesting. Yeah. We're gonna take a break. Okay. okay. And when we come back, we're going to talk about a tap routine from Lonnie and Ronnie McFadden. And we're going to talk about that, uh, how who choreographed it and everything when we come back and take a look at this tap routine. <laughs> Welcome back to Conversations. We're here with Lonnie McFadden, and we're going to uh, finish up the conversation about that tap routine that we just saw. Tell us what inspired that routine, and how on the world, how in the world did you get to do that on a bar? Very cautiously, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it did come about because I was at the Phoenix, and the Phoenix is what it is. I mean, you know, it's it's been the it's been the Phoenix for almost 20 years now, and and they've got carpet all over the place. When I first started playing down there about five years ago, I started doing that that happy hour set at the Phoenix on Fridays, and and people that had been seeing me through the years would be coming in, and one or two of them would be always asking me to dance, even though there's nowhere to dance, and I never took my tap shoes because I you know, there's nowhere to dance, and after. One day, uh, a group that was big enough called me. I came in, they, you know, they got the crowd to go in. So I just jumped up on the bar in the little corner there and put the mic on the bar with my street shoes on. And I, and you know, they liked it. And then they started. It started being where everybody was expecting it. So I started bringing my tap shoes. And now, 
when when Ronald's not down there, I, I danced around. You know, you were there. I, I danced there. around the whole bar. But since Ronald was there, I figured he might as well get a taste of this. Right. And it's, and it's, it's a different way to to view tap dance because <laughs> when you when you're not used to jumping up on a space that's that big, you got that much depth. It's very intimidating because one, you know, a lot of the steps that a tap dancer does, you do different things with your ankle to make your foot go so fast. Right. And you have to have this much room to make a a, a movement this this because you need that much room to to do the thing with your ankle. If you do it the wrong way on that bar, you're gonna be sitting in those people's laps. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's really interesting every week. For me to try to figure out what am I going to do and how can I keep it interesting, not just to them, but to me too. I don't want to be boring while I'm doing the same thing all the time. So. Now, was that the first time your brother uh, did that routine on the bar? It wasn't the first time, the very first time, but it is the first time since the Phoenix. See, the Phoenix has changed. They used to have these, these theater lights that, that were hanging. So it was this big bar that was up there. So by the time you stand on the bar, there's these lights in this big bar here and Ronald used to and I understood it tall. used to kind of just grab it a little bit so you kind of feel like you know where you're at now there's nothing there so that was the first time he did basically you you got this much room and and you nothing between you and falling down but air and <laughs> it was fun for me to watch and try to figure it out <laughs> okay now do you guys dance together a lot now I know that you, you used to do you dance together a lot now? As much as is this is life permits, and by that I mean the economy is what it is, and so nightclub situations are not what they were 20 years ago when we were at the Marriott four days a week, Marriott downtown. We had a budget, well they had a budget big enough to to have us in there. We had a three piece rhythm section, and my brother and I Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday every week for like two years straight. Those budgets no longer exist. That's the reason even at the Phoenix, I have a partial rhythm section, and it's just me. Place Other places I play, it's just me and one accompanist. Uh, and no, on the weekend, that's the only play, time I have a partial rhythm section at the Phoenix and at Plaza 3, you know, because the budgets won't allow it. Now, to, now, that's the long, but the short answer is, yes, we still get to play special events, and we'll be at the Isle of Capri next month. Okay. Well, this month. This month. Okay. Uh, and that was a treat to see you and your brother. I had seen you, you before when he came to the Phoenix. I was very excited. and good. And it was a good show. Um, in your bio, you named Charlie Parker <clears throat> as one of your great influences. Can you tell us what was, I mean, and we know he's special and great, but for you, what was so special about Charlie Parker? Wow, it's, 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 it's a long list, but if I had to condense it, the biggest thing that, that still stands out about the greatness of Charlie Parker, I mean, let's get past the fact that he had more technique than everybody else. Let's get past the fact that he was the first person that, that almost, almost single-handedly created the language of bebop. It's like the language of bebop is, is almost all the statements that you hear. It's like the end of the statement ends in a, in something that sounds like you're saying bebop. You know, and so it's like the way he, so he changed everything. He had more facility of his horn than anybody he had no peers when it came to his abilities. But then, over and above that, and this is what kids for generations have yet to accomplish, me included, to have that level of technique, to 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 deal with it mathematically as in a sophisticated way like he did, but then to be able to come down and be able to boo bibi do bib do it bibi dibi did did at that point, all the big women in the back of the church are doing this. <laughs> okay. I mean, so here you got a guy that's more sophisticated than, I mean, he could have, he, he was just as sophisticated as Stravinsky in them musically, but he was just as down home as collard greens and hammocks. And I mean, Charlie Parker, so, 
soul. So when you listen to Charlie Parker, that is, I think other than Louis Armstrong, I can't even think of anybody else that as a soloist had that level of sophistication, mathematical for sophistication, that much, uh, that much ability on their horn, that much originality, and that soulful. That so here's a guy that can relate to the the dentists, the doctors, the the people on Wall Street musically, uh, scientists, but he can also relate to to the people on the street. Like a, you know, as you know, the junkies were around saying bird, writing "Bird Lives" in the subways when Charlie Parker died. He related musically. It's still, I mean, you listen to Charlie Parker. It, God is. It's very humbling okay. <laughs> for me as a musician to still listen to Charlie Parker. It's like, God, he was so blessed. He makes you want to go and pull out his old records and listen to him. All the time. I still listen to Charlie Parker yeah. quite often. Okay. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure having you here on the show. Thank you. But we're going to do another show, uh, and I want to talk some more with you. I mean, this has been interesting. I didn't get through half of the stuff I need to get through, okay? It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. If they wanted more information about Lonnie McFadden, they can go to your website. That's right, www.lonniemcfadden.com. To find <laughs> out about where you're going to be and yes. your, all your schedules. So. Yes. Well, wonderful. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Rob. Okay. And thank you for being <laughs> with us, and we'll see you next time on Conversations. Thank mm -hmm. you.